There's a reason Final Fantasy VII is the most popular in the whole series, and why many who loved it were disappointed by its sequel. It wasn't because of this guy. Seven's Cloud and Eight Squall were both equally unlikable teenagers with bad haircuts, which is probably why I identified with them so much at the time. What Eight lacked was not a good protagonist, but a strong antagonist. Tetsuya Namura said, With FF7, I wanted to do a story where you're chasing someone you've known was the enemy from the get-go. I wanted to avoid having the kind of plot development where you get to the end of the story and suddenly this boss you've never heard of yet just appears. Which is ironic, because that's almost exactly what they did with Final Fantasy VIII. While Seven was the best of the Old East, arguably the best of the Old West came three years later with Baldur's Gate II Shadows of Arm. Both games feature a villain who's personally involved with the protagonist all throughout the story. And it likely wasn't coincidence, but influence. Final Fantasy was written into the original feature list Bioware came up with before starting work on Shadows of Arm. These two villains got screen time and dialogue, power and prose. It was the antagonists that elevated these games above all others. It's remarkable how little development many RPGs give their villains. In the first Baldur's Gate's opening, the unidentified villain gets only enough screen time to put your dad in the fridge before disappearing until deep into the game. I'm sure Pillars of Eternity had an epic final showdown with the main antagonist, but at 20 hours in, I hadn't even met them yet. The ultimate villain of the Mass Effect series, Harbinger, a name I had to look up to remember, gets only one proper conversation hidden in DLC. Hidden masterminds and unknowable Lovecraftian horrors don't get much dialogue, which is why they are especially poor in Western RPGs where one half of the interactivity is in conversations. But East or West, too many villains are monsters or mysteries that have very little presence in your hero's story. They show up late to the party and hardly speak to anyone when they do. But in Shadows of Arm, John Irenicus is the very first person who speaks in the game. Ah, the child of Ball has awoken. It is time for more... experiments. He's not only the first to speak, he has the most well-recognised voice actor of the whole cast and more voiced lines than any other character. The entire starting dungeon in the first one or two hours of the game is dedicated not to your backstory, but to his. In Shadows of Arm, Irenicus doesn't just bookend the experience, he stays involved all through the middle. Despite the game opening up early on and giving the player a real choice about what to do and where to go, Irenicus is always there waiting for you when you close your eyes, invading your dreams. It's a decent way to have you interact without coming to blows, which is hard to avoid with villains and protagonists. And if you play it like I do, sleeping in towns only after clearing a dungeon or finishing a mini-adventure, it's great for pacing too, reminding you of your overall goal after finishing a smaller one. Your overall goal, without saying any spoilers, is to chase Irenicus down to get your friend back and take revenge for all he did to you in the opening. Unlike other games, this time, it's personal. When you finally catch up with him in the mid-game, even more happens to tie the two of you together, to set up the finale. Irenicus is more than just the final destination of your hero's journey. More than a monster to be killed or a mystery to be solved, He's a character in every act on center stage. All the RPGs I love the most have that, at least to some degree. Saren left a void in later Mass Effects that was never completely filled. Sephiroth was the reason Seven was so memorable, and Irenicus made Shadows of Arm a 17-year-old RPG that doesn't just hold up compared to modern storylines, it betters them. You can open your eyes now. My next video will be about Baldur's Gate 2 too, so sub for that. And if you want to see more right now, try my most popular video, Defying Gamer Logic, an oldie but a goodie. Thanks.